driving success through employee engagement. And my name is Eileen Nash with Rutgers Executive and Professional Education. I'm going to be your moderator of today's webinar. So we've allotted 25 minutes for the presentation and approximately five minutes for questions. If you look at your screen now, you can send your questions to me throughout the presentation using the question box. Um, we will address all questions at the end of the presentation, but use the orange arrow depicted here to open and close your controls. With your controls open, you'll see the question box. All you're going to do is type in your question and hit send. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our instructor, Dr. William Castellano, is Associate Dean of Rutgers Professional Executive and Professional Education. And Bill, you can take it away at this time. Okay, well, thank you, Eileen. And um, welcome, everybody, to this webinar on driving success through employee engagement. Uh, much of the research that I'll be uh, referring to uh, throughout this webinar, we published in a book, Practices for Engaging the 21st Century Workforce, Challenges of Talent Management in the Changing Workplace, which really goes into a deeper dive of many of the things we'll be covering, as well as um, the issues of managing uh, a multi-generational and diverse workplace. For today, the learning goals that we would like to cover is to really just discuss about a, a proven measure of engagement, one that we know is positively related to employee performance and organizational strategic outcomes. Also, briefly talk about the different types of HR systems and the key drivers that we know directly impact employee engagement. And then lastly, talk about the importance of the right type of leadership and management uh, necessary for creating a culture that can foster employee engagement. So when we think about employee engagement, I mean, there's been a lot of research um, looking at uh, strategic HR from a macro perspective, meaning we know there are different types of HR systems that directly correlate to various strategic outcomes. Um, high performance work systems, high commitment, high involvement work systems. The real issue is how is that dynamic happening? You know, we call that the black box. And now that ref means that we need to get down to the micro perspective. What are the employees' perceptions of these kinds of HR systems? How is it impacting their attitudes and behaviors that could either positively or negatively impact strategic outcomes? So what I'd like to do during our session today is to talk about this dynamic, the different types of HR systems, the drivers that are directly impacting strategic outcomes, and understanding the, the true measure of employee engagement. So we, when we talk about an HR system, what we're referring to are the different types of HR practices that are typically used in combination to achieve perhaps a strategic outcome of an organization. And it's important to understand how different types of practices impact either the work environment, the competencies, or the behaviors of employees. So for example, the work environment we create by the different ways we design jobs um, and different ways we create organizational structures. So for example, a company that is standardized, looking to compete with price, will most likely design jobs in a highly standardized way, perhaps in a hierarchical type structure, whereas organizations that are competing with innovation uh, will design jobs giving people much more autonomy, decision making, um, and the structure would most likely be a flat organizational structure uh, focusing on collaboration. Depending upon the kinds of strategies organizations are pursuing, uh, we would need different types of employee competencies. And we bring and manage competencies into the organization through our recruitment, selection, and training and development practices. And then lastly, we need employees to behave in different ways to achieve strategic outcomes. If we're focusing on customer satisfaction, or some organizations may be focusing on innovation or productivity, we find that the different types of performance evaluation systems and reward systems directly impact um, those behaviors. It's the old saying that people basically will do what you pay them to do. And setting up specific goals for people to achieve those outcomes are critically important. So the key 
with an HR system, they need to be internally aligned, they need to complement each other, and they need to be aligned externally, uh, for example, helping an organization achieve a specific strategic outcome. So the question for today is what do we really mean by employee engagement and what kinds of systems and drivers uh, are impacting people's level of engagement? And in my research, I look at engagement as primarily being a psychological state. I think all too often when I look at different uh, measures of engagement, uh, many common measures include the conditions of engagement. And I think it's critically important to separate the conditions and perhaps the drivers of engagement with a true measure of engagement. So for me, I look at it as a psychological state that's very positive, um, a very fulfilling work-related state of mind. Um, some researchers call it an elusive force right, that motivates people to higher levels of performance. It's clearly a multi-dimensional construct, and I think the three common measures that uh, focuses on this construct of employee engagement are job involvement, effective commitments, and positive affectivity. So I think those measures collectively capture this construct of engagement. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into that measure. When we talk about involvement, it's the identification that somebody may have with their work, um, how much time you spend thinking about the work that you're doing, how engrossed are you in the work that you're doing. Um, a related topic or construct is called flow, where you're looking at perhaps being carried away. You, you lose a sense of time in the work that you're doing. You're very focused. You're getting immediate feedback on the type of work that you're doing. And most important, it involves that balance between your competencies and the objectives that you have to fulfill. Effective commitment. When you think about commitment, there are really three types of commitment. Uh, employees that remain with a company because they want to is really what we mean by effective commitment. Um, those who are with an organization because they need to is capturing this construct called continuous commitment. And if an organization has employees that are there because they ought to, that's what we would call normative commitment. Now interestingly, a lot of surveys that I have seen focus on continuous um, commitment. The classic question, uh, do you plan to be with this organization uh, for the next 12 months? And interestingly, the research on continuous commitment is it's not very positively related to performance. Uh, many of your best employees who have very marketable skills may answer that they are planning to maybe consider an opportunity externally. And then more important, you know, maybe some of your, your least productive employees who don't have many options will answer that question in the affirmative. So a much better measure of engagement is effective commitment. You know, these are people who want to be with the organization. You know, the classic question would be, would you recommend this organization to somebody else? You know, they support the organization. They identify with the values and the goals. They have pride being an organizational member. A much better measure of engagement. And then lastly, Positive affectivity is a much better measure than satisfaction. And again, if you look at the research, satisfaction is not a very good measure if you're looking to understand the dynamics of employee performance. You know, we all know that there are many perhaps unproductive, maybe even lazy employees who would say that they're very satisfied with the work that they're doing. So satisfaction in and of itself is not a very good measure positive affectivity is measuring somebody who comes to the workplace with energy, vigor. You know, these are the kinds of people that are contagious. You want to work with these kinds of individuals. So I think collectively these three measures um, capture what many people think of when we think of the psych psychological state of employee engagement. So now let's look at this framework. Uh, we know that all roads begin with the HR system and how that impacts competencies, the work environment, and the behaviors of employees. The, the different types of policies and benefit programs 
emanate from the HR system. We also know from research that there are very specific drivers of engagement that we know are positively related to involvement, effective commitment, and positive affectivity. And for those people who are high on psychological state engagement behave in ways that are very conducive to the organization. They go above and beyond. Um, they engage in what we call organizational citizenship behaviors. They volunteer for extra work. They help a coworker. And in turn, that helps the organization achieve various strategic outcomes, whether they're focusing on productivity or innovation. Other organizations may be focusing on customer satisfaction. And for those who can complete those strategic outcomes, will then generate the financial outcomes, revenues, profits, and market share that's important to the organization. So making these connections, I feel, are critically important to drive the business to perhaps implement certain kinds of policies and programs. It helps those people who are making these decisions um, able to make the business case that the reason why we're implementing this program or this benefit is because we know there's going to have a, a positive impact on outcomes that are conducive to organizational goals. But let's look a little bit at these drivers. The challenge is not every driver is going to impact the engagement of every employee. I make a, a point in my book to highlight there is not a one-size-fits-all solution. You know, particularly in this day and age where organizations oftentimes have multiple generations working under one roof, highly diverse people coming from different cultures. So the key is to separate in your surveys the measure of engagement to, and the drivers of engagement and, and be able to understand which of these drivers are impacting your employees. But we know from research that these drivers are highly correlated with engagement. Development, not surprisingly, um, very um, motivational for Gen Ys coming into the workplace, for Gen Xs looking to climb the corporate ladder, and even baby boomers who are looking to retrain. Flexibility really goes across the board. Um, every cohort um, values flexibility, but for different purposes. For example, Gen Y values flexibility because they want to balance work and their own personal self-interest. Gen X values flexibility because they do oftentimes need to balance work and family responsibilities. And even baby boomers today who perhaps are now phasing into retirement um, equally value flexibility. And that's surprisingly working parents, dual income, couples um, equally value flexibility. Another common driver um, highly correlated with engagement is autonomy, um, giving workers the freedom to decide how work gets done. Closely related to that would be empowerment, giving people the authority and the responsibilities and making their own decisions. Meaningfulness, um, another um, key driver of engagement. Um, a feeling that one is receiving um, a return on the investment that they're making in work. Um, some of the key dimensions of meaningfulness, employees feel that perhaps they're making an impact on organizational goals, uh, or the organization recognizes their contributions, or the work that they're doing is challenging and conducive to their personal growth. Role fit, um, equally important. Yeah, people come to the workplace oftentimes engaged in, in multiple roles. The key is work role fit, the relation of an individual to the role she or he or she assumes in the organization. So role clarity helps the individual um, to be aligned with organizational needs, whereas role conflict could be a, a real stressor that diminishes performance. From an organizational perspective, when you're thinking about this particular driver, um, it's important to ensure person job and person organization fit. Does the person have the knowledge, the skills, and the abilities to be able to effectively do their job? And more importantly, are the values and the interest of that employee 
is that aligned with the values and the goals of the organization? Line of sight um, research there is saying how do you know that the work that you're doing is impacting uh, perhaps your team and your work group goals? How, is, how are those goals impacting the organizational goals? So being able to see um, very, very clearly that the work that you're doing um, is also impacting higher organizational goals. Perceptions of fairness, that's a pretty broad um, construct. Uh, there's a lot of dimensions to perceptions of fairness. There's distributive justice, looking at the inputs, your experience, perhaps your level of education, and the outputs that you're getting, the different types of compensation and other benefits that you're getting for the inputs you're putting in into the workplace. And the goal there is to make sure that if my inputs are comparable to your inputs, I would expect us to be compensated equally. Um, if that's not the case, if I see somebody with a similar amount of inputs is being paid higher than myself, you know, that's going to have a negative impact on perceptions of fairness. Another dimension of fairness is procedural justice. You know, are the criteria that organizations use to, to make performance management decisions, compensation decisions um, fair and transparent? And another dimension of fairness is my interaction with management. You know, are they showing me respect? Are they showing me dignity um, in the interactions I have with my managers? Coworker relations, not surprisingly, very correlated with engagement. Individuals who have rewarding interpersonal interactions with their coworkers experience greater meaning in their work. And a supportive and trusting relationship with your coworkers forces what we call psychological safety, another important concept. And basically what that is, is people can come to the workplace and be who they are. You know, my coworkers, my manager, the leaders of this organization will accept me for who I am, whether I'm diverse, whether I come from a different perspective, maybe we look a little bit differently. You know, people need to feel that they have a sense of belonging, they have a social identity with the, the people who they work with. And that in turn could actually lead to shared engagement, which generates high morale and obviously will have a positive impact on organizational outcomes. Not surprisingly, management and leadership, um, there's probably more research on the relationship that managers and leaders have on employees' engagement than all the other drivers we've been talking about. Uh, we know that oftentimes people join organizations because of their reputation, but they may leave an organization because of the relationship that they have with a particular manager. So selecting and developing managers and leaders uh, are very important things to do to keep in mind when trying to create an engagement culture. Um, when we look at management, things like supportiveness, trustworthiness, providing recognition, having high integrity are key dimensions. When we think of leadership, uh, we really think more about transformational leadership characteristics. People who have a vision, they're open. And in this global world, um, they have a sense of what we call cultural agility. They can relate to different cultures and be effective in different cultures. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into these two areas. When we assess management effectiveness, probably the two most important dimensions would be supportiveness and trustworthiness. So managers who foster a supportive work environment, you're looking at people who are highly empathetic, right? They can understand and have concern for employees' needs and feelings. They're willing to delegate work. They allow people, employees, to voice their concerns. Uh, they provide resources for developmental opportunities. Trustworthiness talks more about consistency and integrity. Are they behaving um, consistently across time and context? Um, is there consistency between words and deeds? How accurate are the explanation um, and the information that they're giving employees? 
and again, do they express concern and consideration um, of employees' interest? When we think about the right type of leadership to create a culture of engagement, um, overwhelmingly uh, the research leans in the direction of what we call transformational leaders. Um, leaders who engage in transformational behaviors produce transformational effects. These are highly charismatic people. You know, they create a sense of passion. Um, people who are high on this dimension also are high on emotional intelligence. Um, again, very empathetic, very much aware of their own feelings and the feelings of the individual that they're leading. Um, they create a highly stimulating um, environment where people can think independently. So I often, when teaching leadership, um, get that question, well, you know, what's the difference between a transformational leader and perhaps a situational leader? And what I often use is this quote, uh, which unfortunately comes from um, uh, an unknown um, person that says a good leader gets people to believe in them. And I think that's an example of a situational leader. You know, we have confidence in that person's capabilities and we're going to follow them. A great leader gets people to believe in themselves. That is what I think a transformational leader is all about. You know, people feel good about themselves they want to work for that person, um, a much different perspective when we think about leadership. So what we wanted to do today is to make sure that um, there is enough time for me to, to answer your questions. Um, we are um, taking a very deep dive in this topic in a three-hour module that we present in a certificate program called Next Gen HR. So for those who perhaps want a little bit more information on this topic, um, you can take one of these modules. We're offering one in October and one in November. And as a thank you for participating in today's webinar, we would extend a 20% discount for you to register for any of those modules. So I believe people have been submitting questions to Eileen, and I think this could be a very good time for us to answer any of the questions that um, you have interest in. Okay, so we do have a couple of questions. The first one says, from your experience, how many questions do you think is the right amount for an employee engagement survey? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, you know, unfortunately, what I see with a lot of companies is they try to go with measures that are the most parsimonious. Um, and as a result, they're not truly able to assess which of these drivers are actually impacting the engagement of all their employees. So from my experience, a good engagement measure is about 10 questions. And then you want to have a series of questions about the various drivers that we know are related to engagement, different benefit pro programs and policy programs. So I would say between 50 and 75 questions would be a reasonable a number of questions. Today, many of these surveys are done online, and people can you know, take a survey over a period of time, answer a few questions, and come back later on. So I think that makes it a little bit easier for people to ask that many questions. But by asking that many questions, you can really start assessing which of these drivers are impacting different employees within your organization. Great. And so the next question says, of the 10 drivers of engagement, which would you say are the top three most important? I would say, from the research that I've done, um, flexibility, as I said, is a driver that impacts every generational cohort, but for different reasons. And of course, it's, so, it's also impacting um, dual income couples and working parents. Development and growth um, is another major driver of engagement in this day and age where skills become obsolete very, very quickly and individuals are looking to be more marketable in the labor force. Being able to develop and, and, and gain 
marketable competencies can be highly engaging for individuals. And then I think meaningfulness. Meaningfulness, particularly for Gen Y, um, are they getting meaning out of the work that they believe in the values of the organizational goals? Um, could be highly motivating, particularly for Gen Ys. Right. The next question says, have you had instances of measuring the engagement of leaders in an organization and then exclusively? Say that question again. Have you, well, it's, it's a three-part question. Have you had instances of measuring the engagement of leaders? And then it's followed up with, in an organization. So I guess we can yes. start with that. Well, that is critically important. When we try to communicate to um, clients, if we're involved in an engagement survey, is you, you want to first look at your workforce um, strategically. And you know, there's a lot of research on what we call A players, right? People who have the, the most impact on your organizational goals. Um, they're directly contributing to the success of the organization. They have very unique skills. Many of those individuals are in leadership positions, but not all. That's your most important group. You know, people in your organization that are adding the most strategic value who have the most unique skills, those are the individuals you absolutely want to be engaged, you know, which is why it's so critically important for you to be able to ascertain the different groups of employees in your organization and, and measure um, their specific levels of engagement. So for example, if you just did a, an average of engagement, and I've seen this at many organizations, where they're happy that um, you know, 80% of their employees are engaged. And then if you do the assessment that I'm recommending, you find out that that number is not as high for the most strategic positions or for the leadership team within that organization. And that could be a problem. Okay, um, we got quite a few more questions. I just wanted to let you know that our 30 minutes is up, but we're going to stay on and answer uh, as many of these questions as we can. So you're welcome to stay um, and listen. So I'm going to continue with the questions. The next one is regarding perceptions of fairness. This person says he's heard some companies are working to be transparent regarding what everyone is paid. Uh, his company policy is that pay disclosure is prohibited. Have you seen any research showing the impact of transparency on engagement? Well, compensation is a, a huge um, component of perceptions of fairness. And compensation includes not only salary, but the benefits that people are eligible to participate in, um, perhaps the level of training um, that they may be able to be involved in, um, options, um, different types of incentive programs um, can be divided among different groups of employees. So people generalize um, compensation across all of those dimensions, and they may or may not know specifically what an individual is making. So I think as long as people understand the range, um, if there are different grades within an organization, and the different types of um, benefit programs that different levels of employees may or may not be able to participate in, um, management training as an example, options, stock options as an example. I think collectively people look at all of those as the output that they're getting from the organization um, compared to their individual contributions. To the extent that organizations share salary information um, because they are transparent and the criteria that they're using is, is fair and consistent, that will only more positively impact perceptions of fairness. But a lot of organizations are fearful of that because um, they may not have um, the perfect set of criteria for making those types of decisions. Great. Um, the next question asks, how long should I stay on a job um, that does not affect her reputation where the boss is usually addressing her and the, I guess the other staff in a diminishing way, shouting and losing control? 
how long should you stay in that position? Is that the question? Yes. Well, that's certainly a personal decision. I think people need to look at all of the perhaps resources that may be available to them within that organization. If they're having a problem with a coworker, if they're having a problem with a supervisor, um, being able to perhaps go up to the next level, um, having an objective um, third party, which can be an employee relations type function, um, all of those types of policies, you know, giving people a voice, giving people um, a, a complaint resolution process, which typically means going up to the next level of management or going to a, a neutral third party to help resolve these types of conflicts um, are very, very important to you know, create an environment and a culture that's going to positively impact engagement. Great. Uh, the next question said, would you recommend using engagement survey scores as a performance measure for managers in addition to their business outcome measures, or is it more of a just a tool to use? No, absolutely. I think people, organizations that take this seriously, you know, and clearly if you're competing with your human capital or intellectual capital, you know, engagement is a strategic necessity. And I think holding managers accountable for um, ensuring an appropriate level of engagement of their employees should be a component of their performance evaluation. I've seen companies that perhaps set aside, you know, up to a third of a manager's bonus um, tied to specific engagement indicators, um, which really sets the the message that the company and, and the leadership team takes engagement seriously, and that is a critical component of a manager's responsibility. So clearly tying it into their performance objectives and then having the teeth tying it into compensation will have the most impact on engagement than almost any policy that can be thought of. Great. Um, the next question wants to know, how do you get incentive and reward and perceptions and fairness to work in an organization under union contracts where everyone gets the same raise, if any, and the performance evaluations are not meaningful except for remediating poor performances? Well, if you're in a union environment, then clearly that's, that needs to be part of the whole contract negotiation. Um, and I. I have seen, even now with union contracts, um, them incorporating uh, some variance in performance measures where uh, they're allowing people who um, are overachieving and, and receiving high levels of performance evaluations, a higher perhaps merit um, increase. But those unions that do negotiate very set contracts uh, across the board incentives, then there has to be some other driver um, of engagement. I, uh, you know, perhaps it is job security that people would find um, as a, a counterbalance to um, not having much variance in, in compensation. So I think it varies from union to union. Um, there are ways of, of creating variable compensation programs even in a union contract. But again, for those union contracts that don't allow that, then I think you need to look at and communicate some of the other um, dimensions that the union is providing for their, for their workers, whether it's job security or a better, better benefit program, um, opportunities for training, um, and the like. Okay, great. Next question says, um, we're in the middle of this right now and possibly hiring a consultant to help increase employee engagement to enhance morale. Most of the employees are baby boomers. We do not have an HR department, just a personnel office for administrative duties. What would be one of the first steps we should take? Well, the first step to take is to um, develop an engagement survey which should include a, a good measure of engagement and should also include various drivers of engagement that your particular organization um, is either 
currently implementing or, or planning to implement so that you could assess which of these drivers are going to have uh, the greatest impact on the level of engagement for your different employee groups. And it, you, know, you can divide your employee groups by generational cohort, but you should also, as we talked previously, divide your employee groups by perhaps the strategic value of, of different positions that people are in. Um, okay, the next question says, how do you think motivation is connected with engagement? Motivation was a big topic in the recent past. Well, when we think about motivation and engagement, what engagement primarily gets at is what we call intrinsic motivation. Um, previously, most motivational models focused on extrinsic motivation, you know, focusing specifically on compensation. Whereas, as you can see from the drivers of engagement, um, that's only one small dimension of a driver that's going to impact one's motivation. Many of these other drivers are involved with what we call intrinsic motivation. I get meaning out of the work. I'm, I'm fulfilled with the work that I'm doing. I enjoy working with my coworkers. Um, I'm able to balance my work with some other life priorities. You know, that is an intrinsic motivation, which um, is that when we think about engagement, um, a stronger concept of engagement is intrinsic motivation, not necessarily extrinsic motivation. Great. Couple more questions, Bill. The next one wants to know: Can you explain again light? Or sorry, line of sight. Line of sight is: Do I understand how my performance impacts the team? or the department that I'm currently working with, and how does that impact organizational objectives and goals? So having a line of sight, how does my contributions ultimately impact the organization? If I can see that the work that I do is directly impacting an organizational objective, that's highly motivational for, for an employee. Um, Unlike if I'm just a cog in a wheel and I'm, and I'm performing a very, very, very small task and I, and I don't understand how the work that I'm doing is, is creating this much larger outcome, that's much less motivational. Seeing that line of sight, seeing how my work and my performance impacts my group, my department, and the organizational goals um, is highly motivational. And that's really the genesis of the balanced scorecard, you know, where you, know, you cascade these goals at the organizational level all the way down to the group level, all the way down to the individual level. Right. Um, the next question says, we have a few coworkers who look down on others and create an oppressive atmosphere. How do we address this, especially since no one wants to specifically talk about it out loud or to management? Well, that's why having good questions in an engagement sur survey about co-worker relationships um, is important because you will then be able to assess, well, there's a problem. You know, there, there's a, a group of um, employees in a particular part of the organization, and there, and there is a, a conflict. And I think that's an opportunity for management and perhaps with HR to investigate what are those what are those issues? And just like with a manager, I think employees need to have you know performance objectives that also include um, their ability to work effectively in teams, for them to be um, treating people with dignity and respect. Um, that clearly should be part of even a, an individual employee's um, performance objectives. But having again what we talked about previously, a mechanism in place for an individual to be able to voice their concern, um, whether it be to management or the next level of management or another third party, which could be HR or some other group, to investigate and, and try to resolve those kinds of conflicts. Great. Um, what specific tactics do you suggest to impact employee engagement when the management driver is low? 
when what is low? I didn't get the end of that. When the management driver is low. Well, I think you then need to focus on are you picking the right, manage, right individuals to be managers, holding them accountable, as we talked about before, you know, perhaps um, including in their performance objectives, um, measures uh, of engagement, um, how they're treating their employees, how well are they supervising their employees. I think that would be the first dimension. And then also, again, looking at are there other drivers of engagement that we can implement that can have a positive impact on engagement for this group of employees. Perhaps it's creating um, a flexible work schedule or providing people an opportunity to, to learn something new or, or to redesign work to give people more autonomy. Uh, being able to diagnose all those problems um, in a survey and having the right uh, means to, to create the different programs and strategies um, all need to be working together uh, to solve those issues. Okay, two more questions. One is what techniques are best for analyzing the impact on strategic outcomes? That's an area that I've seen uh, many organizations make a mistake. Um, for example, once, if you're looking at this model from a micro perspective, meaning you're asking an, an employee about their level of engagement, the outcome that you need to correlate that with first would be an individual outcome, uh, their level of, of individual performance, their likelihood of leaving the organization, um, their extra role behavior. And then at that point, you can aggregate individual responses to a higher level and assess whether or not an aggregate measure of engagement is being positively related to a strategic outcome. The problem that I see with a lot of those analyses is at the survey level, you know, they may have hundreds, they may even have thousands of employee responses. But at the strategic outcome level, um, they may have only five or six measures. Uh, for example, I've, I've seen an organization that was looking at the aggregate engagement levels of employees and customer satisfaction ratings. The customer satisfaction ratings were developed at the divisional level, and they had four divisions. So they were doing this sophisticated analysis with four divisions. You know, without getting too geeky here, you know, that, that, that's statistically invalid. You, know, you, you can't do a valid analysis with, with four divisions. Um, statistics would say you need at least 30. When we consulted with that company, um, they actually had 50 departments. And we asked them to take their divisional customer satisfaction report and generate a report not at the division level, but at the department level. So now they had 50 departments. And we were able to then do a very valid um, analysis of the relationship between aggregate employee engagement and strategic outcomes. And in fact, um, it was very positive. You know, we, we show that there was a very positive relationship that was valid between engagement and strategic outcomes. When they only did the analysis with four, you, know, you would argue that that's not a valid relationship. Great. And the one final question, Bill, I'll field because it was going to be how I um, recap this for you. So the question was, will they be getting uh, a link to the recording of today? And the answer is yes. We've recorded today's webinar, and we will be sending all the attendees uh, a link to it very soon. And that concludes the questions. Well, I enjoyed um, the questions, and I hope this was informative for, for all of you. Again, for more information on this topic, we are going to be um, covering it in a more detailed um, session in one of our modules. And of course, um, I go into this topic very deeply in the book that I published last year. So I wish all of you um, the best of luck in assessing your own levels of